Hello and welcome to another episode of PQA, Petra's Questions and Answers. The show where you send me your tech questions, and I do the best I can to make sure that no kittens are killed today. Now I know that last week's episode aired a little late, so I haven't gotten that many questions from you guys yet. Uh, but there have been a few, so enough to actually put the show together. Not bad, thanks. In the interest of getting more people to ask questions, uh, I'm going to change the format a tiny bit and make question reading on the show anonymous. Unless, of course, you want your name or whatever, uh, screen name, username, actual name, associated with email mentioned. Just kind of put a little line in there. By making the question reading anonymous, uh, I'm hoping that it'll create a more comfortable atmosphere for people to ask questions. I'm starting to feel like I'm teaching a high school sex ed class here. All right, what am I doing? I didn't even finish the intro. I'm Alex Venz, otherwise known as Petra, and, well, let's just get started already. Questions, questions, right. <clears throat> Our first question today, and actually the only one to get emailed to me... Seriously, guys, come on. Questions at PetrasTech.com, right here, somewhere. Or, you can send questions via Twitter. Twitter.com, Petra, right here. Anyway, the only question I actually get emailed to me uh, is this one right here. Let's see, it reads, How do I put together a romantic dinner for my significant other? Apparently somebody missed my comment in the first episode about this not being Dear Minx. I'm not here to give you relationship advice. Obviously, what constitutes a romantic dinner is different for every couple, and I couldn't even really tell you what to make for dinner, because I have no idea what you people like. If I get to a point where I feel that I don't really have any better questions to answer, I can revisit this and offer up a few interpretations on how to put together romantic dinners. But, again, this show is mainly supposed to be tech, and this is a little outside of that. Doing the geek cooking thing? Yeah, I'll toss in an episode every now and then on how to make a simple dish. But this is a little much. The next question came to me through one of the many tech forums which I frequent, and it reads, How do I assemble and use a T-line in my water cooling system? For those of you familiar with water cooling systems, you have a couple different options for filling and bleeding, one of which being a reservoir, the other being T-line. Let's take a look. When water cooling a computer, you always need a way to get the coolant into your cooling system and the air out of your cooling system. The most common way of doing this is through using a reservoir. Now, some people don't like using reservoirs just because they take up extra space and um, there's additional costs associated with it, even though you can get like the SwiftTech Micro Res for what, maybe $25, $20, however much that costs. Um, that actually happens to be what I use most of the time just because it does make filling and bleeding faster and easier and I am kind of lazy. However, there is another way to get coolant in and air out of your system, an inexpensive and compact way, and that's through the use of a T-line. Now, I'm going to show you how a T-line goes together, and more or less how you use one. So, I brought out my trusty old water-cooled socket A system uh, that I'll be demonstrating with. Let's get started. This isn't the greatest example of a T-line, because you'll see here, uh, this is actually tilted downwards, which makes it more difficult for the pump to feed, because remember, these are not self-priming pumps, they're gravity-fed. Uh, so for it to feed properly, you actually have to put a whole lot of water in or tilt things around. The basic items which make up your T-line are this run of tubing here, which goes to your pump's inlet, this run of tubing here, which acts essentially as your reservoir, and then this T-fitting right here. Now, T-fittings come in all different types, all different materials and sizes, and you can get them in polypropylene, like this one, you can get them in black nylon, you can get antimicrobial tees, you can even get um, acetyl tees that are taps, you can screw barbs or or compression fittings or whatever you want into them. So you can get creative there. But essentially you're looking at a T-fitting and some tubing, and that's your entire T-line. At the end of your fill reservoir tube, which attaches to the vertical portion of the T, um, you can attach a fill port if you'd like, and that can either be panel mounted to the top of your case or uh, just left tucked away um, inside the case, as this one has been, which I'll pull back and show you in a moment. But essentially what happens is you fill the system by adding water through this line here, and then you cycle the pump on and off to draw water from this T into the pump's inlet and out to the rest of the system. Now, this vertical run of tubing will drain very, very quickly. Um, so you end up doing a whole lot of power cycling on the pump uh, to actually fill an entire system. This is why filling a system with a T-line takes a lot longer than using a reservoir, because you have to constantly turn the pump on, shut it off before it runs dry, and then refill the line. Okay, now that I'm pulled back, I'll go ahead and uh, show you this system's fill port, which I keep tucked away uh, up here. I'll just 
get this down. Now this isn't uh, one of the fancy uh, newer fill ports from Danger Den or one of the nice uh, chrome plated brass ones that uh, Swift Tech offers. It's just a simple cheap old Delrin fill port um, that was available on the market several years ago and isn't any longer. <clears throat> As you can see the fill line in this particular T setup uh, is empty and so my demonstration is mainly just going to be filling it. Uh, I'm not going to power uh, on and off the pump constantly to, to fill the entire system because it already has coolant in it. Um, but that can be accomplished by hooking your pump up to a different power supply, just you know, plugging that in and flipping the power switch on the back on and off uh, to power cycle the pump. Now this fill line can be as long or as short as you'd like it to be. Um, some people obviously run it all the way up to the top of the case where they panel mount this. Another nice thing about using a fill port is that you can remove the fill port's plug and then thread a barb into that hole and run more tubing off of that if you need more tubing. Say for example this is really short, let's say you made your, your fill line maybe, you know, go from here to here and uh, you put a fill port on top of that, you could screw a fitting into your fill port and then run a line all the way out to make filling it that much easier. Now some people will try to tell you that you need to have your T-line or reservoir at the highest point in your cooling system so the air will bleed out properly. This is not true. You could have your T-line or reservoir anywhere in the system and air will bleed out just fine. After all, it's the motion of the coolant running through your system which pushes the air around. It will push air to your T-line or to your reservoir and it will bleed out properly so long as the pump is running. Now there are instances where you may need to shake your case around a bit or tilt things a bit to knock air loose that's become trapped in certain components like horizontally mounted radiators, but this is not an unsafe thing to do. Just be careful. As far as order goes, the only thing you should really keep in mind is make sure your T-line or your reservoir uh, directly feeds your pump's inlet. As I mentioned earlier, these pumps are gravity fed, so they won't self-prime. They must be fed coolant constantly or they will run dry, which will damage the pump's bearing. There are many tools that you could use while filling a T-line system such as this. Some people prefer using funnels, some people prefer using uh, large filling syringes like those offered by Danger Den. Today I'll be using this small syringe that I tend to use for general purpose lab stuff when experimenting with coolants because I really don't have much to put in here today. We'll start by removing the plug from the fill port. Next we'll fill our syringe with coolant. Since this is just a quick top up, I'm only using a distilled water and biocide mix. Once your coolant is back in, you can reinstall the cap and seal the system up. Obviously, if I were filling the system for the first time, uh, I would uh, leave the cap off, turn the pump on, and it would uh, drain fluid from the line and um, move the fluid around in the system. I'd have to shut the pump off, fill the line again, um, etc., etc., etc. It's just kind of a rinse and repeat process. Because of the coolant mix that's in the system, uh, the lines have foamed up pretty badly, but that's normal with the uh, coolant that's in here. Uh, but you can sort of see here, as I go up to the top of the line, let me just pull back a bit, you can see the, uh, the small foamy bubbles working their way up the T-line. You should be able to see some movement in there. And there you have it, the basics of working with the T-line. It's not particularly difficult, but it does require a fair amount of patience.